Okay, hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the sixth session of the Spring 2021 Synoikesis Digital Classics uh, semester, which is themed around digital cultural heritage. This is one of the several sessions on geographical topics. This, this session specifically on uh, geographical information science um, presented by Piraya Hadjigazela and Becky Seifried, who um, you can see um, on the screen above me there. And um, this this session will in so in many ways build on and um, and give more context to some of the other presentations of geographical topics in earlier sessions in this semester, such as the community mapping session, the linked geodata and web mapping session, and the intangible cultural heritage session last week, where you saw various um, mapping features being shown as part of the discussion there, and some of some of the terminology used in that um, presentation will will be further explained and demonstrated in this. Um, in this session. So um, so I'm really looking forward to this. This should be very cool. I believe um, that uh, Piraya is starting us off and um, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabby. Um, so, okay, we will be talking about uh, geographical information systems today. Uh, and I am Piraya Hacıgüzeller from University of Antwerp. I'm an assistant professor of digital heritage and metadata at the University of Antwerp. And then Rebecca, uh, do you want, if you want to come forward, just to briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Becky Seyfried. I'm the geospatial information librarian at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to the other slide. Yeah. So what we will be talking about today, of course, GIS is a difficult uh, technology, uh, difficult concept even to be able to talk about in an hour or in an hour of or and 15 minutes. But we will be giving the basics of GIS today uh, or uh, like scratch the surface of the basics of GIS today. Uh, and with, uh, oh, coupled with uh, two important methods within geographical information system technologies, visibility analysis and cost surface analysis. Um, and then visibility analysis will be accompanied by an exercise, hands-on exercise that will be given by Becky. And then cost surface analysis will be coupled by uh, a, a case study, a something that uh, from the literature that I will be introducing, although it will be again brief. Um, so uh, I just have to say, uh, just to give it a, the right framework perhaps, that visibility, the reason to choose here the visibility and cost surface analysis is that um, A, visibility analysis can be relatively user friendly and can be very useful at the same time. But at the same time, also these two analyses are very much embedded in GIS and they came to maturation, they came about through GIS technologies, through geographical information systems. Uh, so they are very GIS-based techniques, although now they can be performed in um, in other uh, platforms like, uh, for instance, R. Uh, they are, uh, with, they they came about with the desktop GIS, so it's they are they are very core GIS technologies, and in that sense they are special. Although geographical information systems can be used to do to carry out other types of analysis, uh, for instance, geospatial uh, statistics. Spatial statistics is one of them. Geostatistics is one of them, and. Uh, 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 exploratory data analysis is another. So it's not that GIS and the analysis functions of GIS, geographical information systems, is limited to visibility analysis and cost surface analysis. After putting that clear, let's move to basic concepts of GIS. Now, first, Probably the question is, what is GIS? So GIS stands for Geographical Information Systems, uh, but then uh, you will have you will also hear things like geospatial technologies, geographical information systems technologies, etc. And also you will also hear something like geographical information science, and that will be with an S and a small C next to it. So obviously, geographical information science is the science of geographical information, geospatial information. Uh, but then you have other geospatial information technologies which are do not necessarily qualify as GIS. But 
in the end, GIS forms a very important um, part of ge geographical information technologies or geospatial information technologies. So it lies at the core of geospatial information technologies. It's a very important uh, technology in that sense that defines geographical information science and geographical information technologies in general. Um, so what is GIS? Um, we could have some sophisticated uh, um, definitions of GIS in the sense that we could say it's made of hardware, people, software, etc. But in the end, GIS is a software, any software that manages to store, manage, analyze, and display geospatial data will qualify as GIS. And I added here making really cool maps and actually displaying geospatial data in GIS software will often be in the form of uh, making maps. That's true. But GIS also, because of its accessibility, made a lot, many of us, turned many of us into cartographers in a way that you can also create especially powerful, especially visually appealing, particularly visually appealing uh, maps in GIS. So that's perhaps that has to be also mentioned as a, as a, a fifth function. Uh, so it's a bit beyond displaying geospatial data, but like uh, also goes in the direction of uh, public outreach uh, and power of maps, making really powerful and beautiful maps and aesthetics of cartography. Um, so what if we wanted to introduce GIS pedagogically, probably we would be uh, talking about six subjects as uh, suggested by the source that I cited at the bottom, uh, Chang from Introduction to Geographical Information Systems. I agree. There are like probably six uh, major chapters would be ma major chapters to introduce GIS. And one of them is geospatial data. We would need to talk really about uh, geospatial data, what qualifies as geospatial data, um, and how do we how do we uh, how do we work on the quality of geospatial data etc so that would be one of the major chapters and then we would also have to talk about the data acquisition and how do we acquire geospatial data uh, and the role of GIS in that process. So for instance, um, how GIS works with GPS technologies, how GIS works with remote sensing, such as LiDAR technologies, et cetera. That would be another thing that we would have to talk about. And then we could also, would also have to talk about how GIS manages data. Uh, and most of the GIS software will do that through a, a relational database. Uh, but we would have to talk about uh, the what is what is uh, what's a geo database, uh, how how it works, and also perhaps talk about some of the open source uh, software that does geospatial data management, like PostgreSQL, PostGIS, for instance. That would be another thing. So these are all uh, major strengths that we could uh, teach GIS through, and they are all big topics. And then data display would come, which would be about how to make maps with GIS, how to communicate your data, data visualization, basically, through GIS. And then we would have to also talk about data exploration. And in that uh, frame, we would have, in that context, what would come would be exploratory data analysis with GIS. How do we do that? How do we do that in a way that's statistically informed? And for instance, one topic there would be data classification, classifying geospatial data, and how that sort of classification has to be statistically informed uh, to be scientifically valuable. And then we would then talk about how GIS does data analysis, what kind of methods, tools are there, how can you expand the analytical powers of GIS by, for instance, writing your own scripts in Python, et cetera. So that would also be another topic. So as you can see, GIS teaching could take an entire semester or an entire year, perhaps, if you wanted to do it really in depth. Uh, but what we will be touch upon today, Becky and I will be geospatial data a little bit, and then the data analysis part, and the rest will have to uh, will have to fall apart. I mean, we'll have to stay out of our discussion for obvious reasons. Now, if we have to talk about um, the logic of GIS, 
so GIS basically works with layers and uh, layers can be, uh, layers are uh, basically the major uh, building blocks of GIS. And um, you have basically in analog cartography, you have similar, um, similar uh, work with layers. So uh, you will have, uh, it's not unknown that you will have a base map and you will have a transparent layer on top of it uh, that you will try to display it at each layer, a different, um, a different data set. And GIS basically copies borrows that logic from the analog technologies and it basically uh, layers on uses layers to uh, display and store and manage different types of information so that's that's one of the major um, major logics of GIS basically so the, the layering logic and I think this will not be unfamiliar to most of you because uh, in today's geospatial technologies, to apps, mobile apps, for instance, where we use uh, GIS or GIS-like apps, uh, we already see that kind of logic with, for instance, uh, being able to put place markers on our maps, et cetera. That, so this kind of thing perhaps was very innovative and new maybe 10, 15 years ago, but it's not the case anymore today in um, the, with, as, as we are getting more and more uh, familiar with geographical information uh, systems like applications that in our mobile devices. So here it is, some of the, like two of the most well-known geospatial information, just geographic information systems, web GIS applications that we can talk about is Google Maps, the light version that is used for navigation, and then Google Earth, which has 3D data, and that's more for display uh, and visualizations of geospatial information. But of course, uh, the, the landscape of geospatial applications, uh, mobile geospatial applications is not limited to this. Um, so, but what I want, would like to emphasize through this is that GIS is already an important part of our daily lives. And this was, I would like to suggest, not the case uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it was um, new GIS, especially in 1990s, obviously, even beginning of 2000s, it was a new technology. And it's only now, since the last 10 years, maybe, it's becoming a very important part of our lives through navigation apps, for instance. Uh, we, we are very familiar with certain practices that used to be very specialized practices before, like geotagging, for instance. We tag uh, certain images, which used to be things that um, that was specialized and people did not know that much about. So it's GIS, web GIS, especially mobile GIS, is a very important part of our uh, daily lives. And as a result, I think GIS software is also increasingly becoming its logic, uh, its terminology is also becoming increasingly uh, penetrating into public public knowledge, public consciousness, I think, which is a good thing, which makes desktop GIS in academic contexts or, or for instance, in heritage applications, much more applicable and much more approachable and accessible. So there it is, for instance, this kind of thing, navigation and geotagging as daily practices. We, we geotag images, we make it part of our stories, we tell stories with maps. So actually, we are living in a very epified and mapified world uh, where geospatial information technologies and web GIS is playing a, quite an important role. Um, so for, if we come to heritage and heritage related web applications, uh, several countries in Europe and, uh, and uh, I think United States and Canada uh, has uh, web GIS for, for heritage management. Uh, although I do not have a very precise um, understanding and overview of the global scene when it comes to web GIS for heritage, I would assume that what we call Global North is pioneering this, this process. So this is the WebGIS uh, application of uh, Flanders Heritage Agency, Geoportal, 
And these are, uh, for instance, you can filter certain monuments that qualify as heritage here, and that's like a um, uh, WebGIS application uh, that is made available. What I want to put in a parenthesis here is that um, although there is a lot said about the accessibility of GIS and the democratization of cartographic and geospatial information through GIS and digital platforms, we have to also be careful to realize and realize that, for instance, things like WebGIS uh, and the know-how about it is uh, something that uh, comes easier to certain countries than others. So that uh, there's that just a question mark and exclamation mark about there about uh, whether uh, cartographic information is as, as accessible as we often assume. But of course, that's a um, topic for another talk. Uh, but just I wanted to put it in parentheses there. So what is GIS data? So GIS data is a, a good GIS data set is a coupling of geospatial data locational information, so geospatial data, as in locational information, like locational data, with attribute non-geospatial data. So you will have, when I say geospatial data, uh, it is about coordinates. So you will, for instance, here you have a road uh, on the street, on the screen, and now it has an end point, one, like basically the start point and an end point. And then you have a line, uh, the, these two points define a line or a polyline, for instance, although not fully, but anyway, so that's the geospatial component of this information. And then you have the attribute information, like the name, the speed, the direction, and I think length can also be counted as the attribute information that comes in the in the database, the attribute database of GIS, which I will be showing you in a couple of minutes. So GIS data, although it is characterized by geospatial data, obviously, what makes GIS data is the geospatial data. It is often, almost always, coupled with attribute data um, that, that basically, especially in vector format, that basically um, gives it meaning and context and give GIS gives GIS the power that it has as a, as a great database application with a map interface linked with a relational database. Now, we have to also pay attention to uh, the coordinate systems uh, because uh, or uh, spatial reference systems, basically, because when you bring GIS data together uh, in geospatial data in a GIS GI system, let's say, you will have to make sure that your coordinate systems are well aligned. So there are two major types of coordinate systems. On the one hand, you have geographic coordinate systems. On the other hand, you have projected coordinate systems. And just very briefly, geographic coordinate systems still treats globe, uh, our Earth like a globe. Or, or a sphere, although an imperfect sphere, sphere, whereas projected coordinate systems, as you see on the map, uh, on the photograph that's at the bottom, tries to put it flat on, on the paper. And you can already see some of the, I think, that those that picture already very nicely hints some of the problems you may face uh, when you try to do that to our globe. Uh, I, there is some optional reading I put at the sides from S3, which I find is, is a, a nice block to get some more information about it. But what you should take from this uh, session home, I think, if you're new to GIS, is that you have to make sure that your coordinate systems are aligned because with some projected coordinate systems and geographic coordinate systems, there are also different, uh, different coordinate systems. So you have to make sure that uh, you, you're, you, you are on the same spatial reference system to be able to uh, merge uh, aggregate different geospatial data sets. Uh, so if we come to, like, if you're talking about basics of GIS, obviously we cannot ignore uh, the topic of vector and raster data structures. So uh, these are two data structures, two, two types of data structures that GIS uh, represents geospatial data with. But what are they? So you have uh, 
raster and vector data structures store, represent, and manipulate spatial information in quite different ways. On the left-hand side, you have vector data structure, which are basically a discrete geometric entity, and each of those entities will be linked to the attribute database in the ge geographical information system software. On the right-hand side, you have the raster data structure, which is basically almost pixels or raster cells or grids where each grid is corresponds to a certain value uh, in the in 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 itself basically it's not linked to a database but uh, i mean could be but in itself so basically these are two quite different ways of dealing with geospatial data so just to give a little more, a few more examples about it. So if you have, for instance, if you're in a ski resort and if you have hotels, the raster data structure, you will see how it will represent information as like these uh, full uh, raster cells or grids in the, in the raster, whereas the point data, the vector data is these discrete uh, vector data ent entities that you can select by clicking on in the GIS software quite, quite easily. And similarly, you can have lines, you can have areas that needs to be represented with rasters and polygons, etc., or road networks, etc. And then there is also the question of resolution when it comes to this, these data sets. So the raster data sets, for instance, on the all the way at the top uh, in the image about resolution, you will see that the same area can be shown with five by, by a five by five grid, at which point you will have 25 raster cells or 10 by 10, which is 100 raster cells or 20 by 20, which is 400 raster cells. So it can be, and in the end, then you will have a finer and finer uh, data set, but at the same time, of course, your processing power will be will be higher. Your the need for your processing and on the for the vector data, you can see that that will go with adding new edges and nodes to your to your data set. And then, it, just to give a little bit more, like visualize it once more. On the left hand side, you have the vector data, and on the right hand side, you have the raster data, and. Uh, for instance, what is really important here is that if you have one uh, forested area and the rest of the area will be completely empty in a raster data set, raster data set will still tr have to uh, encode each grid with data, even though the, the value is zero. So in that sense, it is much heavier uh, in terms of computer processing, although there are ways to com compress raster data. Um, it, it is, in a sense, a a heavier uh, data structure when it comes to a bigger, you, your data set will be much bigger. So, but as you become more and more familiar with GIS, you will also realize what kind of phenomenon is best represented with raster and what kind of phenomenon is best represented with vector data structures. So this comes a bit intuitively then, and there are also certain conventions and uh, known best practices, obviously. The spa basic spatial entity types for vector data is points, lines, and polygons. So these are the three types that three, sometimes they are called geometric primitives through which you can represent your data. And then here on the left-hand side, you see like points, for instance, a cafe is in a ski resort, lines, ski lifts, and areas you can see. And then on the bottom left, you see how they are represented with vector model. And then on the right hand side with the raster model. So with the vector model, the empty white areas will be no data. So that will be fine. Like there will be no, no uh, data coming from there, which will make your data lighter. Whereas in the raster model, even for the white areas, you will have to have a value which will make your data set bigger, unnecessarily bigger. So these are important uh, part, things to pay attention to. And then this is a vector data set, for instance, with points, and behind that you have a digital elevation model. This, this is just to show you that if you click on one of the points, it will immediately open it in the attribute uh, database. So you can also see the attribute database behind, uh, which only has numbers, but nonetheless, so this is the, what makes GIS very powerful is this interaction between the map interface and then the, uh, and then the database interface.
And then the, this is the raster. When, when you have a raster data for each grid, for each raster cell, you will have a value as it's here. And these values, for instance, at the moment goes with, with the hues, with the colors, but these can be reclassified into, some, for instance, some sort of a land use map, etc. So this is the, this is, uh, this kind of continuous data is very well represented with raster data model. And obviously, when we talk about raster data model, we have digital elevation models, which are very much used and very much uh, forms uh, the basis of several analytical approaches and visualization approaches in GIS. So where you have a raster where each raster cell value corresponds to a certain elevation value. Um, I think this concludes the first part. Uh, yeah, the, the last slide is on the resolution. Uh, so uh, of the raster, so the resolution makes a big difference, although you will want to keep your resolution low and coarse in order to be able to uh, keep your data small, data set small. Uh, it may be that you need higher resolution data, like the, the, the resolution makes a huge difference in raster data sets for the, for, for the, may make a big difference for the, for the analytical results of what you want to do with your raster data set. But it's always a trade off between what you want to do and with, with the size of your data. It should be about computational power. I mean, that, that's always a trade off. So I think this uh, concludes the basic concepts. Wow, that was awesome, Parna. Thank you so much. Um, that was a really excellent overview and introduction to what GIS is. And in this section, um, I'm now going to talk about, well, I'm going to introduce two different types of analysis we can do with that kind of data. The first is going to be visibility analysis, um, and the second will be cost surface analysis. Um, so I'll start by kind of, I guess, connecting this back to what Pry was explaining. I mean, there, this is a really good question. When do we use vector data versus when do we use raster data? And for both of these types of analysis, we're gonna talk about uh, visibility and movement analysis. They both use rasters um, because we're looking at the, the, the landscape, the topography, um, the elevation change in order to understand how people might see across it and how they might move across it. So in a way, I like to think about these types of analysis as phenomenological. Um, they're tools that help us understand the aspects of being in a landscape, but without actually having to be there. Um, and so in the previous photos, we saw photos I took while doing field work, but we can do these kind of analyses from our computer um, using, I mean, this is a screenshot of Google Earth. So you can see that we can do this kind of things with the power of GIS without having to leave our cozy homes. Um, so I'll start and just dive right into the logistics of how visibility analysis works. Okay, so on the right hand side are, is a nice little, <laughs> it's very kind of like antiquated um, drawing showing kind of the concept of line of sight. It's one type of visibility analysis. So you have an observer standing on a mountain, those are the binoculars, and they're looking out across a mountain and where the line is green are parts of the landscape that they could see. And where the line is red are parts of the landscape they wouldn't be able to see. And this is corresponding to the, each of the pixels, right? So line of sight analysis will tell you, yes, the viewer can see this pixel, it's gonna be green, and no, they cannot see this one, it's gonna be red. Um, so typical inputs into this analysis are the observer height. How tall is the person? Are they standing on the ground? Are they in a tower? This is going to affect what they can see across the landscape. Similarly, target height. The point that they're looking at, is that also on the ground? Or in the case of this drawing, we see um, the person is, doesn't need to be able to see the ground. They don't need to be able to see the fire on the ground. They need to be able to see um, the smoke, which might be you know, 10, 20, 100 meters above that point in the landscape. And so you can see in this example, they would have a clear line of sight to the top of the smokestack, but not necessarily to the fire. Some other things that are inputs into visibility analysis, um, how far are we asking the computer to calculate? Um, this is a topic of real world tests. People are trying to determine how far can we really see. Um, I've seen a value of five kilometers as, as the point at which the horizon starts to matter because of the curvature of the earth. I've seen some people say that 20 kilometers is really the limit of a clear vision but a lot of people who are doing visibility analysis might wanna calculate that out even further 
to 40 or 60 kilometers, just you know, to see what might be possibly visible. Um, Priya mentioned that resolution and accuracy of the elevation model will matter. Um, whether we're doing this analysis with pixels that are 100 meters by 100 meters or one meter by one meter is going to affect not only how long it takes to run the analysis, but the quality of the output. And I mentioned Earth's curvature as another factor. So really with all of these analyses, like this cute little schematic we have, the question is always how accurate and or reliable are these models? Here's a really great example that I saw on Twitter. I think it was originally shared on Reddit. Um, somebody decided to calculate the view shed. This is all of the pixels in a particular landscape that the eye of Sauron could see. And they initially did this, um, this analysis and you can see their output on the left-hand side. And then another user commented and said, what about the curvature of the earth? I'm pretty sure that the eye of Sauron could not see you know, the places where the elves lived or something. I don't know this, the proper names. And so the person went back and redid the analysis, making sure that the Earth's curvature was being considered, and they got the more accurate, let's say, result on the right-hand side. So I think this is a really great example of how um, thinking about our inputs, you know, good data in, good results out, is going to affect the accuracy of our, of our models. So another way to demonstrate this, I want to show a real-world example. So this is a picture I took. Um, from a village, a ruined medieval village in a part of Greece. And it's, it's a panorama, so you know I kind of stitched together a bunch of photos. But you can see that from that point, I could see the water, I could see the bay on the left-hand side. I could see a town called Etilo and just barely could see a fortress that's next to it. And I'm actually not even sure I could see the fortress. I just know where it was located. It's right over that hill. Um, and then on the other hand, I could almost see the water at Vathy Bay. And that, I mean, I'm not even sure that's very clear in the photo. It might have glimmered if the sun kind of shone on it, but it wasn't totally visible because it was pretty far away. So I wanted to do a viewshed analysis in QGIS, which is the exercise we're going to go through. And I wanted to see how the results compared. Um, so you can see that this point is red on the map. It's kind of that red star point. And I have the footprints of the other villages in the region in gray. And underneath that, you can see a, a raster grid. This is the, the digital elevation model. I think this is a five, five meter resolution um, raster elevation model showing the landscape of this particular area. And when I ran the viewshed analysis, um, this is the result that I got. In retrospect, I think I actually, when I made this, didn't consider the curvature of the Earth. So I'm not sure how that would affect my output. I have to go back like the Eye of Sauron. And so my inputs here were that I said the observer would be 1.6 meters high. Um, the target would be zero. I wanted to know what, you know, what el ground elevation values they could see. I, um, oh, I guess I was using a different SRTM DEM. So this one's 30 meter resolution. And I set the distance cut off to 10 kilometers. And this is what I got. Um, so to kind of point that out to the photo, you could very clearly see the water. That was confirmed by, by my being there in, in real life. I could in fact see part of that bay. Um, according to this, I should be able to see the town of Itilo. Yes, I can see it. It's covered by that, that blue area in the view shed. Um, but Kelifa, which is the gray bit, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this little bit, the viewshed analysis did not think that I'd be able to see it there. Um, we were able to see this village and probably not the bay. The bay. Um, you can see that the, the blue area does not cover the bay. And so maybe that wasn't really going to be visible according to this analysis. Okay. So there are many different kinds of visibility analysis. We already talked about line of sight. That was the example when you're in a fire tower looking and seeing if you could see a smokestack at a particular point on the landscape. So this is a tool you can run to calculate whether or not two points are intervisible. Uh, the example I just showed is something called binary viewshed. Binary meaning there's yes or no is the potential outcome. Um, and it calculates all of the raster cells that can be seen from a certain point on the landscape. The answer is either yes, it can be seen or no, it can't be seen. Cumulative view shed um, is when you have multiple points. Let's say you have, in our example, we're going to see we have three fortresses, let's say, and you want to see um, how many times can every raster cell be seen by each of those fortresses. And so then the potential outputs are zero, never, they can't see any of the fortresses, 
one, they can see one of them, two, they can see two of them, or three, they can see all three, et cetera. Fuzzy view shed and probable view shed are kind of adaptations of this view shed model that are trying to take into consideration the fact that the real world is a little bit more complex than simply, yes, I can see it and no, I can't. Um, fuzzy view shed in particular is a method that, that understands or takes into consideration the fact that our view kind of decreases as distance increases. Um, and so let's say something that's five kilometers away might be very clear. Um, but even if the view shed analysis predicts that I could see something at 60 kilometers, maybe to a human eye, it won't really be. And probable view shed takes into account the fact that the digital elevation models themselves have some uncertainty built in. We're not gonna look at those two examples. I just wanted to point out that they exist um, because this question about reliability and accuracy is an important one to be aware of. Okay, so just a quick example of what those other, uh, those other types of visibility analysis look like. On the left-hand side, we see um, a model I put together of line of sights between towers on the island of Evia in Greece in different time periods. Um, so you can see that there was a lot of intervisibility between these towers, basically. That's what the lines are showing us. Um, where the lines are present means that the towers were intervisible. Um, and on the right-hand side, we see a cumulative view shed analysis. These are, um, the, on the island of Malta, these are different points from the, from the Crusader era. Um, and I ran a cumulative view shed to see what parts of the island could be seen and by how many. And so you see in this case, the darker colors mean that more of these you know, watch sites could have seen that point on the landscape. What's interesting about this image is you can see that it extends over the water too. Um, so you can get a sense of how much of the water around the island was visible. All right, so now at this point, I'm going to do a live demo where we run uh, a view shed analysis in QGIS. So to prepare for this, um, these links are all on the GitHub page. So you can do this on your own time if you haven't done it already. Uh, the first step is to download and install QGIS. And as of, I think yesterday, 3.16 is the new long-term release. That, that's the more stable version. If you have an earlier version like 3.10, um, or even earlier, it's fine. I don't think that the particular analysis we're doing has changed in between versions. Um, and if you want to install the, the newest experimental release, 3.18, you could do that. Um, it's just because they just released it, it might not be as stable. I will go over how to install the two plugins that we'll be using today. And then also, um, this is the link to get your data ready. So you can download the data set, um, which has the points we'll use in this exercise. But if you feel so inclined, you could supply your own point shape file and elevation raster. That's one vector and one uh, raster data set. All right. So at this point, you should see my screen. Uh, you can see that when I downloaded the data set, it downloaded it as a zip file. And I went ahead and unzipped it. And this is what the data looks like inside that folder. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. So you can see that there are lots of files, but in reality, there are just one, two, three shape files, and everything I highlighted represents one shape file. So every shape file, when you download it, actually has multiple, I like to call it shape file and friends. It has several other kind of auxiliary files that come with it that help the GIS program understand um, the information within it. We also have one, one SRTM file that is the elevation raster. So when you open QGIS for the first time, it should look something like this. Um, this is kind of the welcome screen. You can either select new empty project here or go to project new, just to open a blank kind of space. So the first step is to install those plugins. Um, so to do that, there's a plugins menu. You go to plugins, manage and install plugins. It opens the plugin repository, which opened on my other screen and is now giant, so I'll try to shrink that down. Okay, so we're just going to search in here for the two plugins. The first one was Quick Map Services. 
Um, you'll see by filtering it out, I can select it. And then in the bottom right corner, you'll see an option to install the plugin. I've already installed it, so that's why I don't see that. And you just want to make sure that it's checked on to make sure it's activated. We'll do that also for the second plugin, which is visibility analysis. Uh, you can see here, I've also installed this, so I don't have the option to install, but you would see an install button here. And I'll check it to make sure that it's activated. When you're all set, um, nothing's changed about your session. You just now have these plugins installed. Okay, so we're gonna start by adding that data that you downloaded into the session. And there's two ways, well, there's actually multiple ways you can do this. My favorite is the drag and drop method because um, it seems a little bit intuitive. So I'll open up my file browser. I'll highlight the SRTM DEM and just drop it into my session. We can see that there it is, it has appeared. Um, uh, and now, you know what, I'm going to pause and I'm going to activate one of my base layers. This is one of the plugins that we installed, the Quick Map Services. It should now appear in a new menu item under Web. So if I go to Web Quick Map Services, we can see these are all base layers that I can just load into my session. Uh, one of the ones that I use the most often is OpenStreetMap Standard Imagery. And so I'll click that and it just loads it. So now we see as I zoom out, we get a better sense of where we are in the world. Um, you can see this is the Mediterranean and we're in the Peloponnese and that is where my data exists. So that's pretty great. You can play around if you want and try different base maps if you prefer a different one for making maps of your own. I'm also now going to change the way this DEM looks. It's a little bit hard to see what's going on here. And so I've just opened up the properties window and navigated to the symbology tab. And I have lots of different options for how I want this to appear. But for the sake of this, I'm going to choose Hillshade. And if I click apply, we can see what that looks like. That's pretty cool. And also I want to get rid of all of the values that are over the water, um, which I know have a value of zero because that's you know the elevation of the water is zero meters above sea level. So I will set the transparency um, to zero for zero values. To I'll just say that's the no data value and click apply and they're gone. So that's pretty handy. Okay. So now we're all set up. We have this cool hill shade of the area that we're doing this view shed analysis. And I'm gonna go ahead and add the points now. Um, I'll show you the other way to add data and that is using the browser window. Um, so I will navigate to the location on my hard drive where I saved this information. And now I see that those three shapefile points are appearing here and they look just like, you know, you just see the shapefile. You don't see all the auxiliary, all aux the <laughs> auxiliary files as well. Um, so I can just drag and drop those into my session. And we see they've appeared on the map, but they're a little bit hard to see. So I'm going to change the way they look to, just for the sake of you know, the, the visibility. So I open the properties, go to the symbology tab, and I can just select one of these options. I can customize it if I like, and that is what it appears like now. So I'll do that for all of them, just so that we can more clearly see what we're doing here. Okay, so these are the locations of three fortresses in the area of Greece called the Mani Peninsula. Um, these are all like Venetian Ottoman period. Actually, this one up here is Frankish. So we're talking about the medieval and late medieval periods. <clears throat> and we're asking this question now, like what was visible from these locations to try to maybe understand why, the, why these different powers decided to invest so much um, of their time and energy into building this infrastructure. Um, so let's start with this one that we were looking at before in the example. Um, this is the Khalifa Fortress. Um, it's overlooking this Bay of Ichilo, which we saw in that example that I showed before. All right, so now to do a very basic visibility analysis, um, I will open the processing toolbar, yeah, toolbox, and you do that by selecting processing toolbox. You see it's already kind of uploaded into my screen. And if you've successfully installed that visibility analysis plugin, you'll see it at the bottom. You can also do a search, and this just filters out all of your potential tools and it shows you just the tools that have that keyword, in which case it's showing all of the tools in the visibility analysis plugin. So the first step is to um, generate what are called viewpoints. So 
So I'll click the Create Viewpoints tool. And this is um, the dialogue. And it's asking me basically for all of those parameters that we talked about, all the different things that you can change about the analysis. So I'll quickly go through this, um, not explain everything too much. But the observer location is the Califa Fortress that we're looking at. The digital elevation model is the SRTM1 that we loaded. The radius of analysis is how far we want to cap our you know, view shed. And I'm going to go ahead and just set it to 10,000 meters um, or 10 kilometers um, just to keep the analysis processing down to a minimum. I think in the exercise, I recommend 50, but you can set it to whatever you want. We will leave everything else default, in particular the observer height, which is assuming the height of a of an average person. Um, so we're not taking into consideration that the person might be standing on a tower wall, for example. Uh, but you can play around with that and see how it affects it. And then click Run. And it very quickly generates this output layer. So we see um, it's at the same exact location. Um, it just has some information that the tool needs in order to run the view shed. That's all it's doing. And this is a temporary layer. So if I close my QGIS session, it will disappear forever. So now the next step is to run the view shed tool. And we can see that there are different options that we could pick, but we're going to leave it as binary view shed. Again, that's going to tell us, yes, a pixel is visible or no, it is not visible. The observer location is the output from that previous tool. So we leave that there. The digital elevation model, again, is that SRTM one. And this is the bit that we looked at with the eye of Sauron. So you have to check, take in account Earth curvature. We want, we want it to consider that since we're looking at a distance beyond five kilometers. And it keeps that atmospheric refraction value, we'll leave that. Everything else we'll leave. And again, it's going to save this as a temporary file, which is fine. And there we go. So it's done running. And this is what we see. That's a little hard to understand what's going on there. But we see in the layers panel that everything that is black is zero. In other words, it, it is not visible. And everything that is white has a value of one, which means it is visible. So a quick way to kind of change that and make it a little bit easier to see. Um, we can again set the transparency for zero values. Um, and then if we click apply, they will disappear. So that's a quick way to make it a little bit easier to see what is in fact visible from this fortress. Um, and if I click it on and off, you can get a sense of what parts of the landscape should be visible from this point. Um, right now, it's looking like not a lot. Um, I don't necessarily trust that, but uh, that's okay. We're going to just pause and quickly do that for the other two fortresses just to get a sense of what the visibility is for them. So I'll just quickly go through them one by one. Okay, I've generated the viewpoints for um, Passiva Fortress. You can see that it should be here. And this point, this is the Frankish Fortress that was built. You can see that there's a nice little like road that runs through that area today. And it was built particularly to, so we think, um, get a nice view of that pass and prevent unwanted people from coming in. Okay, and we see that is what the visibility looks like for that area. And again, I'm going to set the zero values to be transparent. We get a better sense of the areas that are potentially vis visible from that fortress. All right. If we wanted to, we could change this to a different color. That might make it a little bit easier to see. Um, so I'll select unique values, classify them. That's assigned it automatically a value of red. There we go. So now it's a little bit easier to kind of compare and contrast these two. All right. And I'm going to show you one more quick method using this third fortress of Achilleo. This is a fun one. It was built in 1570 and then destroyed by the locals the very next year. <laughs> so it didn't do a very good job being a fortress, but you know, they tried. Um, When I run the view shed for this one, the thing I'm going to change 
is the output. Um, so far, up until this point, the two examples, we've just clicked run and it's generating these kind of temporary files. If you instead wanted, if you knew you wanted to save this output, you could specify where the save location is going to be. Um, so I'll click save to file. I'll navigate to a place on my hard drive, maybe in the same folder where I've been working. And I will say I want this to be the view shed for um, activity, for example. And it's saving as a TIFF file. A TIFF is a kind of image. It's one of the types of raster extensions that we see. And now when I click Run, it produces the same thing, but you see it's not called output layer or output file. It is a permanent file that's now saved on my hard drive. So that's something to keep in mind. I'm going to change the way this looks right now. Make the zero values transparent. Great. So we get a sense now looking at this, um, potentially what these three fortresses could have seen or viewed from their locations. Um, as I mentioned though, I was a little skeptical of that one. And now I'm going to kind of go through and explain why I wasn't super happy with that. Um, if we zoom into this area and turn all of these random layers off that I've got, we see that I put this point for the fortress right in the middle of that fortress. In reality though, there are walls around the fortress that might be obscuring um, the view shed from a pixel located inside the fortress. And because I didn't say that the observer height was very tall, I didn't assume they were standing on a wall. Um, I think this might be why when we look at the output, they aren't able to see any of the pixels around the fortress and they're not able to see much of the water of the bay. So I'm going to quickly show you a method for doing a cumulative view shed analysis of a feature like a fortress that's big, that has walls. And you might want to think about if you had stationed, let's say, sentries around the outside, um, what are the things that they could have viewed? All right. OK, so starting with our fortress Khalifa. I am going to create a new layer. And there is this button all the way up here. It looks like a little V and it's got a little new button. And this is me creating a new shape file. We supplied you with three locations and this is a quick demo showing how to make a new one. So again, we'll click these three buttons to navigate to a place where we would like to save the file. I'm just going to save it right here and I'm going to call it Telefa uh, Sentries. And then I'll click Save. The geometry type is point. And um, the, the coordinate reference system, um, the one that we'll pick is the one that is defined as the project CRS. This particular coordinate system is one of thousands you could pick from. It happens to be the one that the data that we provided is in. And we're not going to add any fields to this, so we'll just click OK. We're only interested in the geometry, the locations of these points. And now I'll start editing by clicking the pencil icon, and I'll activate the Add Point tool. And I will just quickly add a few points around the edges of the fortress. And I'm imagining that this is where sentries might be standing. And so I've added a few points. I'll save that and then stop editing. And now I'm going to run those tools again um, to produce a cumulative view shed and see how it compares. So I'm going to create the view sheds from the Kelifa Sentries location. Leaving everything else the same, setting the distance to 10 kilometers. And then I'll run the view shed on that output. <laughs> I don't know which output layer it is. <laughs> That's great. I'll move it to the top. Okay. Taking into account the Earth's curvature, I'll save that output file. Why not? Let Telephone entries, and it assigns the .tiff extension. 
and then run. And I did something wrong. <laughs> uh, I don't know why that didn't work. Pariah, chime in if you see if you saw me do anything wrong. Yeah, I didn't see anything. It looks perfectly fine. But these right. things happen. <laughs> They do, um, and in part, I think it be, could be cut because I selected so many. I have so many output files in here, so I'm just going to go ahead and remove some of them. Yeah, uh, that may help. Yeah, and try it again. All right, so now I don't have any output layers. Yeah, I have another go. <laughs> All right, Kelifa Centuries digital elevation model is the SRTM. Radius is ten kilometers. Leaving everything else the same. All right, we have our output layer. Great. Now we're going to do the view shed on the output layer. Aha, that is what we wanted to see. So you can already see that this is a more complex output than what we were seeing. Um, the possible values here are zero, meaning none, and seven, meaning all seven sentry points could see that location. I'll change the way this looks really quickly so that we can get a better sense of what we're looking at. So I'll make all zero values transparent. And I'm now going to do some fun things with the coloring. So rather than having it be, you know, black to white, I'll select this other option, render type single band pseudo color. Um, I'll classify the data and it's assigned green. That's cool. I'll go with that. So this is what potentially one could see um, from, you know, a more rigorous, let's say, or detailed analysis of this particular fortress. Um, you can see all of the locations on here that are white are pixels that one century could see and everything that is dark green are locations that seven centuries could see. Um, so you see that there's much better coverage of the bay than with that original output file. Um, which one could it have been, I wonder? This one. So this was the original binary view shed. And if I kind of show you the, the comparison, when we considered the placement of the observer and added a few more observers to the, to the outside, we get a more thorough, let's say, coverage visibility coverage. So this is just a demonstration of how this can affect your output in terms of accuracy, um, reliability, and so on. Becky, could you could you also have given that um, those observers a height of say four meters just to, to represent that they were standing on the walls or something? I could. So the interesting thing to think about there is that um, their observer height, the default value is whatever cell that they're standing on, whatever raster cell they're on. So if your elevation raster is detailed enough to pick up on wall height, then it's already kind of taking that into account, um, which is why when I dropped the point in the center of the fortress, that grid cell was lower than the cells around it, which was obscuring kind of the visibility. And that's why we saw a limitation there. And that presumably assumes be safe. You could add a couple meters. Yeah, presumably that 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 would also assume that the fortress is still standing. That's true. I I happen to know it is, but that's a good point. If you are modeling, say, tower height at a ruined tower, just the foundation, you'll definitely want to add um, observer height to that. That's a great point. Um, so at this point, um, we've kind of wrapped up visibility view shed. It was a very fast run through and demo. And now we're going to transition um, into talking about cost surface analysis. I know we're going a little over time and I apologize for that, but I, I hope this, this is fun and engaging for people. So I will introduce the concept of cost surface analysis and then Pariah will finish up with a case study. So just as, as I understand it, we're, we're currently about 25 minutes behind where we were hoping to be at this point. Um, so just sort of being conscious of that, if there are ways we could we could speed up or abbreviate this a little bit. Absolutely. Not, not too much. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just, just to um, just yeah, just to keep that in mind. 
Okay, we'll do. So the idea of cost surface analysis is very similar in the sense that you're using an elevation raster. Instead of thinking about is pixel A visible to pixel v, B, you're thinking how do I get from pixel A to pixel B um, in the least costly way. And so the factors here are thinking about uh, what is cost? How do you define cost? The way most you know, archaeologists tend to, to define cost is by elevation change, um, because going at steep you know, ups or downs is going to cost a lot more um, to you as a walker than going on a flat surface. Um, cost can be defined in terms of time or energy or proxies for effort. So for example, you could say a river crossing is going to cost a lot more than not river crossing. We have that same question though of how accurate or reliable are these models. So there are many types of cost surface analysis. Um, least cost analysis is that simple point A to point B. And there are increasingly complex ones that I will not go into, but it is good to know that they exist because there are concerns with a simple analysis of point A to point B. And so people have these other methods that they've developed in order to add complexity, the way we saw with the advanced view shed analyses. So the simple steps of how to do a least cost analysis are figure out what your cost is going to be, run a tool that creates an accumulated cost service and a backlink raster. I will show you what those look like in a moment. And then from that, you run another tool to actually calculate the least cost path between them. Um, this is a schematic showing the, like, the steps in QGIS if you wanted to do this yourself and you can read more about this. Um, the two tools are RWALK and RDRAIN and you'd access them in the same processing toolbox where we were running the viewshed analysis. Um, and you can see what the inputs are to the tool, what the outputs are, inputs to this tool and outputs. And the drain is the actual least cost path, like line, the vector line that you, that you get from the analysis. This, in case you want to know, is the algorithm that is built into the RWALK tool. Um, it is a time-based method and it's considering elevation to figure out basically how long would it take you to go and it picks the least cost path in terms of like, what is the shortest route? Um, and so this is helpful because it, it's going to avoid really steep areas and it's going to try to prefer areas where the, the elevation change is less because that is less costly in terms of time. So just to give you a glimpse of what those outputs look like, um, this is an accumulated cost surface raster. Here you see that the output is time in seconds. So these raster cells have values attached to them, which are the time it would take to go from this, the red point to that pixel cell. Um, and of course, distances that are farther away are more costly. Um, the backlink raster is interesting. This is a raster that tells you what direction to go to reach the least costly neighbor. Basically, what is you know, the direction going back to that point, which points the way towards the least costly neighbor. The, the whole method uses these two rasters together, like how costly is it in time and what is the direction I wanna to go to the next least costly neighbor in order to figure out the drain, which is what this looks like. And so what you end up with is this really nice polyline showing this is the least costly method. Um, and again, all of the assumptions that are built into this that we have to think about are, how did I define cost? How accurate is my digital elevation model? And even like, what are the assumptions of this algorithm? Um, do we trust that this is giving us a reliable result? And that is where I finish. <laughs> so Pariah, please take it over. All right, thank you, Becky. This was really great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Gabby, I think a nice place to cut back a little bit will be the case study. I mean, I will obviously present it um, and talk a little bit about it, but I will try to keep it um, maybe like wrap it up in 10 minutes. Um, so the case study I want to talk about that's from the literature uh, is um, an article called Dotting the Joints and Non-Reconstructive Use of Least Cost Paths to Approach Ancient Roads. And it's a case study from Northwest Iberian Peninsula from 2015. Um, the reason to choose this particular case study is um, that it's, I mean, normally least cost path analysis are for, for heritage studies in the context of archaeology as well is often used uh, to, uh, to, to uh, reconstruct ancient road networks, for instance. 
Whereas this particular case study, what it tries to do is it's trying to create a model, a certain model through Liskos paths. So it's saying I have certain hypothesis and it's comparing it to very rich archaeological information about that road network. So it is in that sense uh, a, a sort of a Liskos path modeling rather than Liskos path analysis aimed towards reconstruction. So that's why they call it non-reconstructive. And the other reason why I chose this case study is it's focused on different least cost part functions that it's it's trying to uh, have a critical look at different least cost part, fun part functions uh, that can be cost functions that can be used for least cost part analysis uh, and as you will see that makes a difference that shows very clearly that it makes a difference um, in your results so very briefly, this is the type of, this is where we are in the inset, you see it and where, uh, which these are the um, uh, archaeological materials, like basically in situ milestones and uh, bridges uh, that may be uh, delineating this Roman road network in this area from uh, uh, that was this area was uh, conquested, uh, conquered in, uh, in 19, final conquest was 19 BC. Uh, so after Augustus uh, con conquered the area, there was a new road network implemented here. Uh, so these are the, the milestones, Roman milestones, road network milestones that you can see. So on the base of that, there is already a road network and al also on the base of epigraphical information, classical sources, written sources, uh, and also archaeological materials, also interpretations of Roman economic activity in this area, there is a road network already uh, suggested through these multidisciplinary approaches. So as I said, um, the, this study is trying to create a model, this cost parts model, uh, to compare what they can find, they will find uh, with, with this, this road network that has already been proposed for this area. So they are, they are hypo hypothesizing that uh, in their model, there are certain assumptions. And one of the assumptions is that to go going from A to B was the doing, doing it through the least costly parts. So that the, doing it in the most energy savvy or uh, shortest distance would be the, uh, the way that this, the logic of this Roman road network uh, would be based on. So that's what they are saying. But obviously, going from A to B in a least cost way can be one of the main, many considerations. There can be also cultural considerations when you are establishing a road network, etc. So there's therefore, it's an assumption. It's not a fact. So they are trying to see on the base of that assumption uh, the road network that they create as a model, how well it will compare with this existing road network that has been proposed for this area. That's, it's a very detailed study, so I'm not going to go through all of the results. So we will just look at the first results and wrap it up. Uh, but what they do is first, they are trying to identify certain nodes, primary nodes in this road network so that they can use them as, as uh, starting and destination points in their least cost path analysis. But of course, that's also an assumption because they are not aware which settlement settlements in this road network were particularly the primary nodes, etc. And then uh, they are also to model the different efforts required to, to cross through the terrain through different cost functions. So they are also uh, trying to find the right model for their for their results, the most accurate model for, for, for themselves for this analysis. And then they are, as I said, they're going to compare uh, their results with least cost parts with uh, with uh, with a proposed Roman network. So as you can see, I think you can see my cursor. I saw it in Becca's present Becky's presentation, so it I will use it as well. Uh, there are like four um, cost functions that they are first trying to see how they behave in this landscape. So they select a small area in this landscape, and then they are checking these four different cost functions that has been proposed in the literature. And they are already seeing, so they have like a starting point and a destination point. And what they see it is that Tobler and Jober and Slotchkin's uh, cost function have are very much in agreement. And Pendolf's cost function, which is the blue one, 
the least cost path created through that cost function is a little bit off in comparison to them. And then Herzog's cost function does this strange thing like halfway, which really takes off. So it is important, I think one of the more important things to take home from this, uh, this what I'm presenting here is I think to realize that different cost functions are based on, these are basically mathematical functions that are often based on slope variations, like taking slope as a variable um, and has different coefficients, but also different variables, although slope will mostly feature in there. Uh, so it's important to realize that the, the cost function that you use for your least cost path analysis will have significant implications on your results. So these functions are not neutral. They also come with their own assumptions. Um, so what they do is on the left-hand side, they are going to, they are now comparing it. And in, already in this image, you can see the main Roman road in gray. It's a bit of an unfortunate choice for colors because it's not very clear to me, at least this thick gray road, the line is the Roman road uh, that has been proposed through archaeological and historical research, ancient historical research, and the others are the least cost paths. So they are trying to see in this histo hist histogram uh, first how these four cost, well, least, cost least cost paths created through these cost, four different cost functions are uh, corresponding to these Roman milestones across the landscape. And that you see, as I said, on the left-hand side on the, at the, on the histogram. And then you can see, for instance, that Jober and Slutchkin's um, cost function, the, the, uh, the least cost part through, created through their cost function, is able to have 10 of those milestones within 500 meter uh, radius uh, distance. So they are actually uh, aligning very well, their cost function, their least cost part is aligning very well uh, with the existing milestones. And you can also see that they are already in the between 500 and 1000 1, uh, meter um, interval. They also have like catch five milestones uh, so they are actually in great agreement, Jover and Slutchkin's cost function and least cost part is great agreement with the existing Roman milestones. And if you look, look at here, what we see there is basically how this compares to, um, to the Roman network, uh, Roman road that has been proposed through, through archaeological and ancient historical research, let's say, and then you have you can see that within the buff 500 meter buffer, like distance of the Roman road that has been proposed, Jober and Slutchkin has three quarters of their least cost part already in, uh, in that vicinity. So that already shows again that with that uh, Roman road, there is a, a considerable uh, overlap between that Roman road that has been proposed through archaeological evidence and Jober and Slutchkin's least cost part. So at least between these two points in this region, it seems like uh, the Roman road network followed um, followed the logic of least cost paths. So indeed, the Roman road, road network here was um, uh, it was in agreement, was probably uh, built, maybe not intentionally, but to, to take the least costly path from going from A to B. Uh, so I think I will make this my final point, um, although I have one more slide. Okay, I will quickly do that last slide as well. So digital elevation model, the authors very interestingly mentioned that the digital elevation model, cho choosing the right digital elevation model or finding the right elevation data for their analysis was a challenge because the area is uh, taking, is partially in Spain and partially in Portugal, and they have uh, different kinds of geospatial data in different resolutions, in different spatial reference systems, like geographic sy um, systems um, and coordinate systems, I mean, and different um, uh, origins. Some of them were collected with LIDAR data, other with cont digitizing contour lines, etc. So they are also, um, they were, discussing the difficulties of creating a mosaic from these two different data sets uh, from different nation, nations. So it's, um, 
the national strategies for collecting geospatial data can be quite different and it's i think also an important point that this article makes so in the in the end they looked uh, they found uh, free global geospatial data sets elevation data sets and they used srtm uh, and then what they did to check the accuracy of the SRTM or whether it worked well for that region is they digitized 10 meter uh, contour lines themselves in, for this area and created a digital ele elevation model. And then also on the basis of that the elevation model, they made it, they made um, um, least cost path calculation. And then they also used the digital elevation SRTM, digital elevation model. And then they compared, obviously, their own DEM, which they digitized themselves, uh, is very accurate. But the, the SRTM DEM gave very similar results. So they were happy how, the, how SRTM was functioning in this region, in this test area, at least. So they decided to move on with SRTM digital elevation model for the rest of the study rather than taking data sets from Spain and Portugal. And this is the final slide. Uh, so they are in the end comparing. Uh, so these are uh, the black lines are the lines uh, for uh, for Tobler and uh, and then the dotted one is from Yobera. And then the yellow lines are the Roman road network that has been found through other studies. And then they are uh, trying to see from Buracara to Lucas, as you can see in the histogram here, there is some agreements, especially with Yobera's Liscos part, um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the milestones that are on the way. So you can see that uh, there are, again, like uh, five milestones that's within zero to 500 meters of Yobera and Slachkin's Liscos part, et cetera. Uh, whereas with Tobler, uh, Tobler's least cost, part func uh, cost function, uh, it doesn't work very well because uh, there is uh, more than 20 milestones that fall beyond three kilometers distance of their least cost part, Tobler's least cost part. Uh, so they are thinking that at least from this major settlement, Brakara to Lucas, uh, there is some logic of uh, setting this Roman network, roadmap network on the base of Lisco spots. Whereas for Bracara and Asturica, the same cannot be said. Only a very, at the very beginning, there is some agreement between the Lisco spot analysis and the Roman road network. And the rest is basically, as you can see, the two Lisco spots, uh, cost, uh, parts created through Tobler and Jober and Sulachkin's um, cost functions are basically missing a lot of the milestones that are beyond three kilometer distance. And they're not looking between Lucas and Asturica because there is not enough milestones there. So they are basically, and then they move on. This is just a partial result. And they are saying, OK, Lisco spot logic did not explain our, our, our model, did not match well with archaeological data. So they keep working on their model to, to get a better understanding of the logic through which this Roman net road network was established. They introduced smaller settlements to this network to see whether it would change anything. They look at the temporality of the road network, uh, look into uh, bridges uh, for the for crossing water, uh, like rivers, et cetera, in the road network and introduce them as nodes to try to basically uh, change their model, improve their model so that they ca it can match the archaeological evidence much better. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you both. That was uh, that was brilliant, and thank you, thank you for for rushing the end. Sorry, sorry for sort of asking you to rush a bit at the end there, especially since the um, the overrun was was almost entirely my fault. As at the beginning, I did tell you to take your time and and not not worry about time. So sorry for the mixed messages, but but thank you. That that was that was really clear. Um, uh, we we have some discussion starting in the in the comments, and um, so I just say to uh, anybody who's watching this live, please do feel free to uh, ask questions or make any other comments you like in the um, in the live chat feature, which is usually to the right of the YouTube video. Um, so we'll, there's a couple of questions in there which we'll we'll we'll, we'll come to, and and um, if any others come up, um, could I start by asking um, asking you maybe both of you to um, to address um, or either either of you to 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 address what's uh, probably a very simple question. Um, is that it strikes me that with both the um, the cost path, uh, least cost path analysis, and the um, the the viewshed analysis, um, 
they they both take into account um, elevation, a digital elevation model, um, almost almost entirely. But it strikes me that for both of them, um, to, to to different degrees, um, things like forest and land use, um, uh, built up areas as opposed to not agricultural as opposed to scrubland would also make a difference to um to, to both of those those things could you say something about how that sort of information might be taken into account in a gis i could yeah so for the for the least cost analysis that's something when you're building that cost raster when you're determining what the cost will be you could build that in so basically the the logistics are you create a raster that has cost values in it um, and in the very simplest example, you don't have one. You have a raster where the cost is zero. You're assuming the landscape is like equal cost, and the only thing you want to consider is elevation change. But you could build a cost raster where, let's say, swampland has a high cost, and so you might assign pixels within swampland to have a value of whatever you decide your scale is going to be. If it's going to be like percentage scale, you might assign it like eight to represent 80% difficulty, you know, and that's where kind of the subjectivity comes into it. Um, so for land use, that's one thing. Um, I mentioned river crossing. So I've seen examples where they will assign very high cost to rivers, which in effect bars the algorithm from even tr attempting to cross. Um, maybe you'll leave the pixel that corresponds to a bridge as a low value. And so maybe then the least cost path will take that bridge. Um, so at least for least cost analysis, I think people do that quite frequently. Um, Pry, do you have examples of view shed or visibility analysis? Uh, I can't immediately think of it. Uh, you mean that they use something like digital terrain model? Yeah, I can't immediately think of it. But Gabby, it is. Um, one question I think may, that may be related to what you said is also the paleoecological environmental data that's often missing. Huh? Becky, I think it's also about the visibility. That's something. I mean, uh, we. I mean, that's something I always think in these <laughs> GIS analysis that well, where is the? It's very rarely considered paleoenvironmental data. So not the not today's terrain. But the terrain of the past is, is we are often not aware of it. And that has a particular implication for visibility analysis, of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, because this, this, this is one of the questions we, we have. Um, we have actually it's it's closely. Sorry, moved as I was clicking on it. Um, Kaya asked, how are topographic changes taken into account for, for these for ancient comparisons? Um, and so that, that involves not only whether there might have been forests there and there isn't any more, but also where we know the coastline has moved or we know mountains have changed shape because of volcanic activity and, and so forth. I've seen da data sets um, where scholars are reconstructing the coastlines at different points in the past. Um, there's a lot, I mean, it, that takes so much scientific research to be able to reconstruct accurately, but once they're available, then you can use them in modeling of different kinds. Um, I would love it if there were like examples of data sets of like this area was forested and therefore is going to obscure your visibility. Um, but I don't know of any. <laughs> but I think Kea's question is also, that's, do I understand it right? He's asking about yeah, topographic, okay, yeah, or indeed, yeah. So yeah, that's, 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 that, that, that's a very slow arc, slow heritage research in a way. It requires so much time and effort to make those reconstructions. And unfortunately, I don't know, it's 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 not all often done. It's very costly, but that's the right, correct way of doing it, of course. And it's, oh. it's sometimes done at very low granularity or at very high granularity, but on a small scale. It'd be, it'd be amazing to see such a thing, you know, to the to the nearest meter for the whole of Europe, you know, I mean, that's or the whole of the Mediterranean, you know, that, that's, mm -hmm. that would be amazing. Yeah, I was thinking about, um, so one potential application at, the, at a smaller scale would be using historical photo, aerial photos um, to create a digital elevation model of the landscape before major modern infrastructure, because a lot has changed, especially since the 1950s, when new roads were built. I'm, you know, even in the area where I demoed, um, like there have been major transformations to mountains. They've like cut through mountains um, to build new roads uh, in the last 10 years. And so if you used an elevation model from today, it's going to affect your 
models. Um, so one way would be to use historic aerial imagery um, to try to build a, you know, a more pre-modern version of the landscape. Yeah, that would be an easy way of doing it. I mean, <laughs> which would be, I think, indeed efficient, and uh, that that's that's better than nothing. I think. <laughs> yeah. There's another question from uh, from Fabio. Um, says the fact that there are different methods of collecting de collecting ge geodata in different countries. Um, says is is there not a standardized practice globally to overcome these difficulties? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, as far as I am aware, no, there is no standardized practice. So it's also um, there are best practices now, but but I think these data start data sets started to be they they each nation started to collect them long time ago, and a lot of them, for instance, are hand digitized. So it's difficult to create as as usual to standardize that process. But it's a very good question. I think. Uh, there should be, but it's there's probably politics involved, resources involved. Um, so it's there is as far as I'm 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 aware, there is none. What the price? Sorry, go ahead, Becky. Uh, I was just going to add that the example that we saw in the Roman Road Network application, um, and also the little DEM you have in your download folder, is from the SRTM shuttle radar topographic mission. So this is a global data set and. There are global data sets that exist um, that kind of overcome some of these limitations. If they're collected by satellites orbiting the Earth, you know, they can be produced for the whole world. Um, and then they come in a standardized coordinate system um, and so on. But yeah, they, they have limitations on resolution. Um, you know, the free elevation models are typically 30 meter resolution. So if you wanted something that's better than that, you probably are going to have to be working at the national scale. Um, and looking for data through government agencies. And indeed, yeah, Becky. So in this in the this case study that we looked at, they, that's what they are doing actually. So they they don't use the national data sets, but use the SRTM. But what they do nice there is they they try at least to compare the SRTM data set with a very high resolution data set in a test area that they created by manually digitizing 10 meter contour lines. And then when you then compare the two and see that SRTM gives similar results, then you can safely at least assume to use it. But yeah, there are issues with these global data sets that, um, that removes the problem of standardization, but at the same time, it gets in, like, introduces different issues. Uh, so it was, I think that was a very sound methodology that they checked it first. That works. Well, what surprises me, I was going to say, and this is from, from a very naive um, perspective, is that if they're, even if the, the standards used and the methodology used were very, um, very different in the two areas, if they're both accurately recorded and they're both you know using well documented um, formats are they not just algorithmically mappable to one another could you not create a standard data set from from both um, and obviously the answer is not not that simple but i think in theory yes but then in practice i can imagine uh, and that's not very uh, well documented in the article but i can imagine as someone who trying to do some straightforward things like theoretically straightforward things in gis that you you will keep bumping into trouble so um one thing that they were talking about for instance and you will bump into is the resolution issue so for instance uh, i can't remember the detail now but spain has 200 meter and then portugal has 10 meter and what do you do with that I mean, you can't uh, make 200 meter to 10 meter, and then you lose a lot of good data when you make it to. So, and it's also not good enough 200 meter resolution. So uh, that that would be, for instance, one of the reasons uh, why you do it. And I can also imagine that if you have uh, different, so if you have lighter data on the one hand, uh, and then and then manually digitized data on the other, although theoretically you can combine them, the in a way, I can imagine that the, the, the nature of the data sets will also be, um, I, that can be, I think, combined. But I think the resolution will be the biggest problem there. Another factor is the, we talked about coordinate systems, but didn't go into like the, the we didn't even touch the complexity of that topic. Um, because there's also the vertical factor to consider. I mean, so even if those data sets were aligned well at the border between Spain and Portugal, like 
horizontally, they might be using a different vertical datum. And so you might see even a slight shift, like maybe everything in the Portugal data set is slightly lower because they're using a different starting point for measuring elevation, um, that, you know, a different datum. In which case your analysis, there, there will always be this like strange artificial cliff between the two countries if you align those two data sets. Um, so trying to account for that could also be an issue. And, and actually they mentioned that, uh, Becky, in the article, they mentioned there were two different datums, to data, so that they could not, that was one of the reasons, yeah. yeah. And that's not something that's necessarily we're ever going to change because the datums are designed for different locations on the Earth's surface. Um, so it's not like we could come up with one datum that works perfectly for everyone. Um, the global datums we have work well for most people, but if you're trying to do really precise mapping for building construction, road construction, you're going to want a better datum specifically for your part of the world. Yeah, so different types of datums work, data work with different types, places on Earth indeed, and then it will be, that will create complications, yeah. yeah. It's also Just a fact, that sometimes <laughs> the, um, you know, the, the spatial geographic boundaries, um, you know, which would tend to be oceans, right? And and the political boundaries, you know, are not in the same place. So yeah, these things don't don't map like neatly. Yeah. That's true. That's part of it. I think a big part of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, great. Thank you both so much again. Um, we're um, we're pretty much um, coming up to time, so we shouldn't shouldn't run for too long. Um, I want maybe we could say a few words about the about the exercise. So um, Becky gave us um, quite a nice walkthrough of. Um, of the basic principles of creating these um, these view sheds um, visualizations um, using uh, using her data, and that's that's the same data set which we can download from the session page. If you're um, if you found this um, this video randomly on YouTube, the, the link to the session page is below the video, um, and on there there is um, there's uh, the the description of the exercise with the downloadable data set and also links to, to QGIS and so forth. Um, so one thing that people should do, I guess, is um, try to follow through your um, your walkthrough of that, and uh, and to get those visualizations and tweak them a little bit to try and make them as useful as possible. Um, you know, have all three of them, you know, in different colors, different levels of transparency, and so forth. And what else might they might they? I mean, obviously, you know, click on all those other buttons around and see what see what happens. See what happens if you do make people three meters tall. How 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 difference does it make? Um, but um, what else might they? What else might might they do to further experiment with QGIS as they're as they're playing with this? I think the if if you're new to QGIS, learning how to change the symbology is is really fun. I mean, it's there's a lot you can do with it, and I just showed you how to change the color. But you can experiment with all kinds of like transparency and different, um, you know patterns and things like that. And I think we have a link on the GitHub page to the QGIS training manual. So if you are really into this, there are many more resources about how to use the program than what I showed. Um, and so I think following any of those tutorials on the QGIS page would be helpful. And I do just want to add that all of the steps to do what we did are in the slides, the downloadable slides. We didn't, I didn't show them here, but I, I typed up those steps. So you don't have to watch the video again. You could just look at the slides. Can I just add to that? Vicky? Probably, I don't know, maybe it's a little advanced, but maybe you trying to georeference some images may also be a good place to start because that's that's usually the basis of mapping so that you, you try to locate an image uh, in, in the GIS environment in the right place. Uh, perhaps that's also, but I don't know, maybe it's a little advanced, but if you want to go, but as Becky said, there are really nice QGIS tutorials on all of that. If you follow it step by step, uh, I, I'm sure everything will be very relatively clear and it only takes practice. And if um, if you're playing around and you're, you're using this introduction to GIS, but you're not interested in either view sheds or cost path analysis, um, then, you know, the, the sorts of things you can do with GIS, QGIS and any GIS include um, map, map making in the, the, the basic the basic sense. And there's again a lot of that is um, it's fairly fairly basic stuff. You've already got the the various um, base layers and so forth, and you, you could you've seen how to draw points and 
lines on on that. Um, but there's also basic tutorials for um, for doing the the sorts of things that um, that if you've been following this this semester, you'll have seen done in um, Google Maps. You'll have seen done in Recogito, um, and just seen ways in which you can do that sort of thing. Having multiple layers, uh, combining a, a raster layer with a vector layer, um, those sorts of um, visualizations, changing the order of layers, the transparency of layers, those sorts of things. That is very very easy to find um, documentation and um, tips. There's there's um, Ujjaval Gandhi's uh, QGIS tutorials and tips that we've got linked on the session page. Um, so, um, you know, the sort of people who might want to do something, you know, which you have a little bit more control over your map than you do in, in any of the tools we've, we've seen in previous sessions, um, you could very quickly learn how to do some of those sorts of things. Yeah. Cool, great. Thank you very much. And to echo thank you. a dozen thank people you. all saying thank you. They, they loved this session. It was very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.